in the depths of the forest is a hidden archway cut straight into the middle of a hillside. You're faced with this gaping hole in the rock face that looks like some kind of entrance into the underworld. Once you get inside, all you can make out is this dark passageway disappearing off into the distance. Almost a mile away, buried far inside the woods, is a second entrance to this underground lair. There's something pretty spooky about it. You wouldn't want to go wandering off on your own too far. But deep inside, a wall blocks the route. Did the two sides ever connect? And what exactly was this underground site built for? The clues are wrapped up in the history of the United States as it underwent a dramatic transformation around 200 years ago. The East Coast towns were booming, but the Blue Ridge Mountains, part of the mighty Appalachians, formed a natural barrier to the heart of the continent, all but cutting off trade links to those central lands. As a mountain range, they're not particularly big, but they're made up of very, very hard rocks. There's old metamorphic rocks, there's granites in there, and so any topography like that becomes a big, big problem. To travel across the mountains, you had two choices, either along a canal at a painful four miles an hour or in a bone-rattling stagecoach. To speed up the crossing, plans for a new tunnel system were quickly drawn up. And in 1850, work started on this unique design. That's quite an unusual shape to have for a tunnel. We're used to having quite rounded, gradual curves. It's narrow and high, 16 feet by 21 feet. Could its unusual shape have been its undoing? Alan Hale is a local expert on the history of this structure. Initially, the impetus was to build canals, but ultimately it was seen that the best means of transportation as it came towards the middle of the 19th century were railroads. It was planned to be a near mile long underground track. Masterminded by French engineer Claudius Crozet, this would become known as the Crozet Tunnel. This is a real feat of engineering. They did it by hand, by sweat, blood and tears, with only essentially gunpowder to, to help them on the way. But there are no rail tracks here today, and walls inside block off the tunnel. So what happened? When you want to build a tunnel from one side of a mountain to another, you, you look at the rock types. Ideally, you want a soft enough rock that you can carve into, but it has to be hard enough to maintain a, a tunnel. In, in the Blue Ridge Mountains, there's a particular problem because the rocks are quite hard. You've got granites on one side and you've got greenstones on another, this kind of metamorphic volcanic rock that's very, very hard. How would they cut through almost a mile of solid rock? Construction techniques for tunnels at the time were a far cry from what we've got available today. So much so that progress went at about one foot a day into the mountainside. This tunnel was drilled by hand. You can see remnants of these drill holes. Here's one up on the wall there. One man swinging a sledgehammer and another holding a bit, which turned and turned and turned. It would be about three feet at the most, and then shot with black powder. Black powder is dangerous because, at best, it's unpredictable. Many deaths, many casualties would have occurred because of that. But this was not the only danger they faced. As you tunnel through a rock mass, the, the nature of that rock mass changes. And where you get faults or cracks within the rocks, or you might get two different rock types against each other, you can actually have water coming into those gaps. The worry is that these areas where the water's coming through are actually weak. So what they had to do was to shore that up. So they put in a thick 
wall of bricks to essentially line that portion of the tunnel to ensure that it remained safe and stable. The dangers of rock fall are paramount. This is indeed what caused many of the injuries and fatalities during the, the excavation of the tunnel. At least 14 men would die whilst working here, and many more would be injured. So as we go into the tunnel here, you will see that all of this is through solid rock. And basically, nothing has changed here from the 1850s when this was bored through the mountain. As one of the six contending lines racing to cut through to the central states, this Virginia route had to be completed quickly. To double the speed, they went at it from both sides at once. But did the slender design of the tunnel offer another solution? The idea was, in this very difficult conditions with the hard material, to try and maximize the amount of area of material that the men were working on at any one point. People really doubted Crozet and whether his design was actually going to work, whether he could really pull this off. The tall shape meant two separate crews could work inside the tunnel. First, the header crew made a start on the roof section. Next, the floorer crew cleared away the debris below to create the lower level of the route. It would help to slash the construction time. But as they were digging from both sides at once, would the two tunnels line up and meet in the middle? So nearly seven years had gone by. The workers had been working in very back-breaking conditions. There were unstable explosives. They had one of the coldest winters on record. They were hit by cholera. But one day, they actually got to the point where they created about a two-inch hole, and you could see through from one side of the tunnel to the other. They're only a few inches out. They were almost dead on message in terms of where they were predicting the, the one tunnel meeting the other. Amazing engineering feat for that time. When it opened, it was the longest mountain railroad tunnel in the world stretching 4,264 feet. Slashing the time it took to send goods across the mountains, the valuable market in the West was now open for business. Despite its great success, as freight trains and carriages grew larger, Crozet's ingenious design became outdated and too small. Eventually, over 80 years later, this alternative route was opened. So if the tunnel was completed, then why do the two sides not connect today? In the 1950s, a gas company was planning to store gas in the center of the tunnel. And what you see here is a reinforced concrete bulkhead, which seals off the interior 2,000 feet of the tunnel. Ultimately, that project failed but the walls blocking this tunnel remain. Today, the crumbling tunnel entrances are a reminder of the sacrifices made and the bold ambition of the engineers who hope to build a better future for the United States. <laughs>